good evening uh, welcome to the third lecture in the in, uh, inequality conversation series uh, we are very happy to have uh, professor trilochan shastri deliver this lecture today uh, over to you trilochan thank you sri ram uh, at the outset i would like to thank um, the center for public policy at iim bangalore and uh, our chairman professor sri ram for taking this initiative also a big thanks to the authors of this world inequality report it's a truly uh, fantastic report and uh, so our thanks to them uh, some qualifications i would like to make i am a layman i am not an economist nor a policy expert the only uh, qualification if at all is that i have a deep interest in the subject and therefore uh, i am thank thanks to uh, sri ram for allowing me to share uh, whatever um, we are going to discuss so uh, this is not original work this talk is entirely based on chapters 3 and 4 almost entirely on the world inequality report and i will uh, just start off by saying that the average adult ppp is euro 16700 and in us dollars is 23380 in 2021 and the average wealth they make a lot of distinction between income and wealth so the wealth is uh, much more 72900 euros or little more than 100000 us dollars and now we come to the issue of equality so they're saying that the top 10% earn 87200 euros and in euros which as you can see is um more than five times the average income and the poorest half which is the bottom 50% of the uh, world population they earn about 2800 euros uh, so the top 10% are earning uh, some 30 times the uh, bottom 10% yeah uh, then they go on to the wealth inequalities we will come to the definition of wealth but i think all of us have a, a intuitive understanding of the wealth inequalities the wealth inequalities even more so the poorest half earn own only 2% of the world's wealth and the richest uh, 10% own 70 Six percent of all the wealth, so that's a pretty big gap. And the poorest half earn on PPP basis about two thousand nine hundred euros. I'm going by euros because the report largely uh, talks about euros. And the top ten uh, percent own uh, more than a half a million euros. So you can work out the numbers. Now. since we are largely from india here in this uh, discussion i thought i would put up some numbers on the india wealth and india income uh, the first thing that stands out is that the inequality in india has gone up since 1980 uh, particularly after various deregulations uh, and uh, it is now almost it is as high as the inequality was during uh, the time when india was a colonial uh, part of the colonial british empire so the numbers are there in front of you uh, you can see them and uh, the top 1% 10% bottom 50% etc you can see the numbers and the averages so you can see that the in india the inequality of anything is uh, even more the bottom 50% are earning uh, less than 100 or about 100 of the top 10% uh, and the as a percentage of the national wealth we will come to the definition of national wealth a little later uh, they are top 10% earn nearly 65% of the national wealth while the bottom 50% uh, 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 have only 5.9% and this has actually come down post covid from a little over 6% to 5.9% so the inequality is actually increasing so we can go to the next slide please 
Uh, so the previous uh, slide was about wealth. This is about income. As you can see, the income inequality is less than the wealth inequality. And the top 10% own about 57% of national income and the bottom 50% uh, earn 13% of the national income. I would invite our friends from India, those who are part of this discussion, to see uh, whether they are already part of the 10% or not. And for the students and FPM students, whether in a short time, they would also very soon end up in the uh, top 10%. So let's go to the next slide. This is just about India. So before we get into details, I thought I would mention the uh, summary of uh, chapters three and four as um, I could understand them. There are obviously limitations to my understanding and you will realize very soon that I am not a trained economist. So the income inequality is high and growing world over, including in India. And the wealth inequality is even higher and it's also growing. They also distinguish between public wealth and private wealth. I think we have an intuitive understanding of what is public wealth and private wealth, but we'll come to the definitions a little later. But the main point that they make is that the public wealth is much less than the private wealth, which means that the wealth of a nation uh, owned by the governments and various organizations of the government is much less than the private wealth of nations. Then they also talk about the private, uh, the net public wealth overseas, which means uh, the wealth owned by citizens of a country overseas. And from that you subtract the wealth owned by overseas citizens in that particular country. So in countries like the US and UK, it is less than zero, which means that uh, foreigners own more wealth in the US and UK than the citizens of those two countries. The other thing they say very clearly is that higher wealth means much faster growth in incomes and wealth. That means the future looks like the inequality is actually going to continue to increase. Uh, the report uh, towards the end, in the last chapter, also suggests some policy measures. And they say that policy measures uh, can correct this, but it will take time. So this is briefly the summary. Uh, some important facts and some questions uh, I think uh, we need to discuss, and I don't have the answers, so maybe there are people who can throw some light on it. So the first thing is that the uh, premise is that too much inequality is not good or it is bad. Uh, why it is bad is not clearly spelt out, uh, but I will give as a interested citizen who is a bit of a self-proclaimed activist that too much inequality uh, and growing inequality means that it affects governments, government policies, and even the politics of a country. So too much inequality might reflect in the kind of authoritarian uh, regimes that we are seeing around the world. I don't want to get into politics because that's not part of the report, but sure, now we can have a discussion on that later. And secondly, that uh, if the level of inequality keeps increasing, uh, it leads to a lot of dissatisfaction among the vast majority, which is the bottom 50%. And uh, the politics tries to take advantage of this inequality through various means. And uh, we are ending up with increasingly more authoritarian uh, regimes uh, around the world. Um, so you can take a pick on which are the authoritarian regimes around the world. And today's global inequalities are pretty close to the early 20th century of Western imperialism when we had colonialism. Now we don't have colonialism of the type that we had then where one nation would rule or become the ruler of uh, African and Asian countries. 
but we have uh, financial and wealth imperialism uh, that will come out a little bit more clearly a little later. Uh, the just some interesting numbers, the top two uh, 52 billionaires, just 52 people, uh, their wealth is 31% of India's national wealth. I checked and rechecked this number. This is not about income. So the wealth of India is equal to 31% of the top 52 billionaires of the world. So one question is that some individuals may be more powerful than uh, some nations and whether this changes democracy, politics, policy is something that we need to uh, consider. So, uh, gender, inter-country, inter-country is not strictly true, so I will uh, apologize for putting that. But gender, intra-country, in, uh, carbon footprint inequalities are growing, which means that the top rich percent, 10%, 1%, etc., uh, they have much more of the share of wealth and of use of uh, carbon, if you may say, than the bottom 50%. Another very important point that they make is that nations have become richer. That means the citizens of the nations have become richer on aggregate, but largely highly unequal. But governments have become more and more poor. In fact, we will see in a later slide that some of the richest countries, they actually have negative wealth because the national debt is even more than the national income. And the reason that the report mentions is that sale of public assets and corporations and tax benefits contributed to wealthy individuals and poor governments contributes to the growth of wealthy individuals and poor governments. So there's a worldwide ideology of privatization and how properly and how well this privatization is being done has been questioned quite a lot. And at a more basic ideological level, whether this level of privatization is required or not. I will make just one comment on this. Uh, one of the capitalist countries, a small country, is Singapore. And the Singapore government, in contrast to the mantras of privatization, say, in countries like India and various other countries, and UK earlier, Singapore government is actually saying, well, if business generates wealth and income, the government should invest in it. So the uh, Singapore government is actually very aggressively investing in businesses so that it can generate wealth and income for itself. So there are, and Singapore is not a socialist or a uh, communist country. It's a very free market and capitalist country. But uh, they have taken a different approach to uh, the use and uh, disposal of public assets compared to other countries in the world. So let's go on. So I don't know whether this is important or not, but uh, since this is a semi-academic discussion, uh, the report talks about what is wealth. Wealth is stock accumulated over time. And they say that wealth accumulates both from capital accumulation, savings which are invested, and the price effects. That means if the savings rate is high, then the capital accumulates and price effects, the wealth increases. For example, real estate and land prices have been steadily increasing world over, including in India. So that also contributes to the increase of uh, wealth. So the capital is locked or invested into residences, buildings, equipment, machinery, and increasingly the knowledge economy, which includes tangible capitalist software and IPR, and now increasingly the pharma and life sciences, where the intangible assets also constitute a large part of the capital. So capital accumulation is one part of the wealth, 
And the second part is the price effects, uh, which reflect the dynamics of market perception, perceptions of various assets. So the various assets, including land and real estate, uh, have been uh, increasing world over, and therefore the wealth has also gone up. The report uh, is actually, I mean, I cannot stop um, admiring this report. Some of the world's best economists have put their mind to it and they have done a worldwide study with huge amounts of data and they have explained it in simple terms so that even a non-economist like me can make sense out of it. So the national wealth, they say, can be both financial or non-financial. So financial assets are things like bank deposits, stocks, bonds, equities, shares, etc. And non-financial assets are land, housing, machinery, and intangibles. And they talk about the net wealth of a country of or of an individual as the assets minus their total debts. So this is just uh, definitional. Then they distinguish between private and public wealth, uh, which is very important for this discussion. And they say that the private wealth is really individuals like you and me uh, who own uh, firms, shares in firms, bonds, housing, etc. And they say that corporate wealth need not be counted separately because ultimately the corporate shares are held by individuals, even if there are mutual funds which are holding corporate shares, the mutual funds in, in turn are uh, held by individuals. So this is the private wealth. And then there is also private foundations and institutions and religious organizations. In a country like India, you know, the religious organizations, uh, I mean, two great religious organizations, um, I am actually uh, quite sympathetic to the religious organizations but you know there's an economic side to it so the two great uh, organizations in um, religious organizations which come to mind is uh, tirupati and uh, the padmanama swami temple in trivandrum which have got a uh, huge amounts of uh, wealth and there are many other such and the government's response to the growth of wealth of these institutions has been to take them over. So Tirupati has been taken over, the Shirdi Sai Trust has, in Shirdi has been taken over and the Padmanabha Swami, I suppose, will also if not already taken over, will be taken over. So the government doesn't like religious institutions uh, to have a lot of wealth, but they are quite happy with allowing uh, corporates and individuals to have huge amounts of wealth. Now, public wealth uh, in contrast to private wealth is owned by local and central governments around the world. Their assets, according to the report, are public hospitals, roads, bonds, publicly owned firms like public sector units in India, etc. And maybe it's a small omission. They don't mention land explicitly as public wealth. But I looked at the numbers from India. I have not reported them here. The value of land that the Indian government owns, because in India, by definition, anything that is not owned by private individuals or corporations is owned by the government. And the value of the land is just humongous. So... Maybe this is a point for discussion and maybe being a non-economist, I am missing some nuance there. Let's carry on. Now, they go into a very nice discussion on wealth and income, national wealth and national income. And uh, they look at the ratio of national wealth to national income. So the uh, conceptual point they make is if the wealth increases at the same speed as national income, then the relative importance of wealth is the same. And the growth in wealth simply reflects normal economic growth. And the wealth, uh, wealth income ratios, as per the report, helps us to dis disentangle 
and separate the growth of wealth from the growth rate of the uh, economy. So let's go on. Now the report says that when the wealth income ratios increase, the total value of assets is growing faster than the incomes. Why is this happening? Either nations and societies are accumulating more capital or the price of assets is increasing. So some of the top corporates, even in India, are investing in assets. And we read from the reports on the web that Bill Gates is one of the largest landowners in the United States. I don't know, hundreds of thousands or millions of acres of land that he owns. So as the land prices go up, the wealth income ratios will also increase disproportionately to the rise in income. The report also focuses separately on private wealth to income ratio, the value of private wealth divided by the national income, and also on the public wealth to income ratio, the value of public wealth divided by national income. So let's see what the numbers look like. So this is the worldwide figures, and it talks about the ratio of wealth to national income. And over a 25 year period from 1995 to 2020, I think uh, we miss one important point in this report. I mean, we may miss. They're not talking about odd events here and there. Talk, they're talking about global trends over 20, 30, 100 years. So that means that there is some weight to what they're saying. So if you look at the global wealth as a ratio of the income, national income, it moved from 450% to 600%. That means the wealth has increased much more than the national income. The private wealth has actually gone up tremendously uh, from 375% of the national wealth in 1995 to 550%. However, the public wealth has actually gone down. So they have this very intriguing um, title of the chapter, which calls rich nations and poor governments. That means that the wealthy billionaires are growing richer, but the governments are actually growing poorer because public wealth is held by the government. Yeah, so let's look at some more numbers. The amazing thing is that in rich countries like the US and UK, uh, wealth to income ratio is actually negative, which means that the national debt is more than the value of all the assets. And this is quite a stunning uh, fact. And if I've got it wrong, please correct me. The reports are with all of you. So the governments are li living off debt and living off the future, as they say. So these are US and UK are supposedly, and the US certainly is a wealthy country, and other countries like France, Japan, and Germany, the wealth to income ratio is less than 30%. It is much higher in countries like China and India. We'll see that a little later. Now, the report says that the decline in public wealth is one of the principal reasons is due to rising public debt in these rich countries. However, the wealth to income ratio remains stable. And they talk about it for two reasons, that the reduction in public assets due to privatization. It means that uh, the denominator of wealth is decreasing in these countries due to privatization. And therefore, the ratio remains stable. And number two, that the assets which are still with the government there is an increase in price. So the, there is a stability in the ratio, but actually the proportion of public wealth owned by these so-called rich governments is actually pretty low. That means the country is owned by the private individuals, which is theoretically and conceptually good, but unfortunately, because of extreme inequality, it is owned by a very small number of highly 
quel dire. Hello? Have we lost something, Sriram? We need no, no, to... please go ahead. Please go ahead. You're on. My internet connection is unstable. I'm sorry about that. But can we go to the next uh, slide or if we're already on the next? Ha, ah, net foreign wealth. So, you know, being written by very fine economists, they also talk about the net foreign wealth. So one of the questions is uh, things like national sovereignty. I don't know whether it is important or not. Uh, we can debate that philosophically. But they talk about the wealth of the citizens in other countries minus the wealth of foreigners in the country. That means if you take the citizens of India, say, how much wealth do they own in other countries? And from that, you subtract the wealth of foreigners who own wealth in India. So here are some numbers expressed as a percentage of national income. In the US, it is actually minus 45%. The report says between for minus 40 and minus 50 percent. So I've just taken 45 percent, which means that as much net 45 percent of national income in the US is actually owned by foreigners. In China, it is positive. And we all know that China is the new uh, global superpower or emerge. I mean, it is already a global superpower. So China is got net overseas uh, wealth much more than the wealth owned in China. It must be also something to do with policy. The report also casually mentions that the income generated from this wealth in the US is actually from is actually greater than that in the Chinese. That means that the wealth held by the United States citizens overseas is generating higher income than the wealth generated by Chinese overseas. But I don't know how long this will remain. I'm sure it is going to change. So for here, we hear that China has invested in the countries surrounding India, including in Sri Lanka and some parts of Sri Lanka because of the investment of China and the inability to pay for the governments and the clauses in those negotiations and deals practically belongs to China. So the future picture may change. So let's go on. One very important point that this report makes, I think this is worth thinking about, that, you know, when the Industrial Revolution came, I'm not an economist, I'm so therefore you'll have to pardon me. Before the Industrial Revolution, wealth was in land. Then it came in industries. Now they're arguing that the wealth actually comes from the financial financialization of economies, from stocks, bonds, shares, whatever, investments, etc. So they have come up with a definition, and I really respect this group of economists who have come out with this report, it is pretty masterly, I mean, at the end of the day. So they're talking about the ratio, the financial, they have come up with the ratio. They say that the ratio of total debt plus equity of households, governments, and corporate sector to the national income is the measure of financialization. That means how much is the money invested compared to the national income. China has actually reached that rich country status. So in China and the rich countries, the ratio in 1980 was between 250 and 500%. I mean, there are various countries there, so I didn't want to get into details. And by 2020, it had gone up between 700 to 1800%. That means the financialization of these countries is at an all-time high. The report says it can have dire consequences as it is more vulnerable to financial crises. Now, see, finance and capital in seamlessly from one country to the other. So, for instance, today, 
the sensex dropped by some more than 1000 points whatever the reason is that is because they say that something has happened in some other country either the interest rates have changed or there is some concern about some issue or the other therefore now why has the this thing because foreign institutional investors can pull out 100 million dollars 1000 1 billion dollars in a day from one country to the other so therefore the consequences could be pretty drastic and they say that because of this international seamless movement of capital uh, it can spread worldwide very fast and they give the example of the subprime crisis in the us where it the crisis started in the us but it spread globally i think the major point that the report seems to be making i mean from my understanding but i am happy to be corrected is that the financialization of econo- economies uh, through big money billions hundreds of billions of dollars moving up and down from here and there leads to instability and it can lead to um, crashes in the stock market subprime kind of crises and so on so that's i think one of the points that they make so let's move on so this slide i have put up in some detail because it is quite interesting for me uh, so there is a question from uh, one mr shashi murthy this report is a world inequality report and if you google it you will find it uh, you can download it so i think the bottom row is what i would focus on and we will discuss all of it so the bottom row says the growth in wealth you can see that it goes from 3 to 3.2 to 4 to 5 up all the way up to 9.3 so what is that category what are those categories where the growth rates are much higher and number 2 i forgot to mention it in the slide these are not growth rates over one or two years these are growth rates over 30 40 years so what does it say it says that the top 10 if you go to the first row of this uh, table it says that the top 10% of the population have wealth of 75.6% of the global wealth the top 1% have 37.8 and so on and so forth and the last three columns in the second row or the first first and second row are in- interesting because it talks about 1 slash m this is 1 per million that means the whatever the ratio is 1 per million is 0.0001 they didn't put it like that so they are saying that one in a million the top one in a million persons in it, in the world uh, they have a 3.5% of the global wealth the top one in 10 million have 1.9% and the top one in 100 million have 1.1% the top one in 100 million they have counted and they said there are 52 such individuals obviously over time this will change and you can see the increase no 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 let's go back the average wealth uh, so from about little more than half a million dollars if you go down the row in the third row you go from half a million dollars to 77.4 billion dollars is the average wealth of people who are 1 in 100 million hindi mein bolte hain lakhon mein ek karodon mein ek 100 million is 1 in 10 crores my mathematics is correct so this is the number from which you can do the calculation that if 52 individuals in the world have an average wealth of 77.4 billion you can multiply that come up with the total wealth of these 52 individuals and compare it with the wealth of india that's how we came up with the number of 31% of india's national wealth is equal to the wealth of 52 individuals in top 52 individuals in the world of course there are countries which are much smaller than india i don't know nepal sri lanka pakistan bhutan 
so there are individuals in the world whose wealth is more than the national wealth not the national income of several countries now the point that the report labors to make is that the growth of wealth over a 30 year period is much faster for those who are wealthy i mean if i have to put it in simple english money makes money it's not investment profits etc that makes money money makes money so this trend actually shows this report actually shows one thing and the, this slide actually shows one thing and the report also mentions it that the inequality around the world if this growth rates are the way they are is going to increase and not decrease shall we go to the next slide please so these are actually putting the same stuff in different numbers so top 001% so since we are in india 1 lakh mein ek 1 out of a lakh of the adult population which is is 51700 persons they own 6.4% of the global wealth that is lakh mein ek they earn they have 6.4% of the global wealth and the bottom 50% of the population which is 2.6 billion people much much more than this 52000 people they own only 2% of the global wealth so in terms of wealth inequality it can't say anything more drastic you can do whatever ratios you want you can see that uh, the bottom 50% are much much worse off than the top one in a lakh one in Hundred thousand. Now they also talk about the historical trend, so they trace it from the early twentieth century to the mid twentieth century to today, and the graph actually shows that. I was not able to import the graph so easily. I think I am little technologically uh, challenged, so I just put up the numbers. So if you see in Europe, uh, there has been a kind of a reduction in the top one percent as well. from 55% in 1910 to 25% in 66 to 22% but in the us it's been reverse it bottomed out from 45 to 25% which was the bottom and then it went back up to 35% so in the us the inequalities in wealth have actually continued to increase and the report says that the policy measures led to the decline in the early 20th century uh, we'll see those policy measures these policy measures are basically um, progressive taxes on uh, income and wealth and uh, the deregulation and the opposite policy measures that came in uh, towards the last quarter of the 20th century around the world they led to an increase in inequality so the report uh, quite um, clearly says that policy measures have contributed to it i am not much of an economist to figure out whether they, what they are saying is correct or not but it seems to be correct so can we go on please so when we come to countries of interest for us in india in 1995 unfortunately the report doesn't talk about 1991 but 1995 is as good as it gets the top 1% of the indian population had 22% of the wealth and as recently as 2020 it has gone up by 10% just 1% of the population now owns 32% of the wealth in china it was more of a socialist economy the top 1% started off at a low base of 16 wealth 16% but due to the chinese policies of basically china is a one party capitalist country it has moved from 16% to 30.5% so therefore the growth of the top 1%'s wealth in china has been dramatically higher than in india and the report says the drivers are privatization now it goes on a little bit to discuss about russia also but including in india and china oil aluminium steel 
coal, various national resources were privatized. And there was always a strong ideological backup to it. But that privatization has its own uh, questions about was it a fair price? Was it worth doing? Uh, was there some understanding between those who got <coughs> the national resources from the government and from individuals and political parties in the government? We don't know all those things. But privatization, the report says, has been done uh, at a discounted rate. So the private uh, rich individuals were able to get national wealth at a discounted, much very discounted price and then uh, increase their wealth and so on and so forth. So this is a big problem. And in India, I would just try to mention that along with privatization, uh, it led to a huge debt and loan write-offs in the largely in the public sector banks <clears throat> because the governments and the um, high net worth individuals or corporations who are involved in this privatization ordinary people cannot be involved in it because it involves billions of dollars thousands of crores etc they took debt from private sector uh, banks not private sorry public sector banks and a huge NPA started accumulating. The most dramatic example of this uh, in terms of numbers, I'm only talking about numbers, was the ILFS, which was run by Ravi Pat Sarthi. And various reports say that uh, the uh, loan write-offs were well over 1 lakh crores. So they took over public resources like particularly highways and so on and so forth. And to finance that, they took loans from the banks. They forgot to repay the loans. And uh, public money went down the tubes and so on and so forth. So whether this privatization is good or bad is an ideological issue. Whether it was done well or not, there is no ideological issue. I mean, it was not done well. So that is one driver the report talks about is privatization. And in Russia, they call up oligarchy literally. When they started privatizing the Russian wealth, uh, a few handful of individuals became extremely rich and powerful. And they are smart enough to immediately align with the political bosses that's to the world over, fund their elections and support them in various ways so that their wealth remains secure. Then they talk about uh, not only privatization, but snow snowballing effect of capital accumulation. I did some study. I'm not an economist, but what I found is that for the wealthy people, the savings rates are much higher than for people at the bottom of the pyramid to talk the 50 percent hardly ever save so the savings uh, allows them to accumulate capital and therefore increase their wealth by investing in real estate land um, share stocks financial assets etc so it's a multiplying effect the snowballing effect of capital accumulation and finally deregulation which led to higher returns on larger wealth so the report, I have not mentioned it here, the report says that if an entity, an organization has $100 million, which it uses in the financial markets to get returns, versus an individual who may have, I don't know, $10,000, the rate of return for the organization with $100 million is much, much higher than the rate of return for the person who is investing only $10,000 because they have access to information. They can invest in large corporations or large deals. Uh, they have inside information, whatever it is, whatever the reason is. So the deregulation also led to higher returns on larger chunks of wealth, which means that 
further increase in inequality. So let's go on, please. So it very briefly mentions a report about where is this wealth? For the poor, which is the bottom 50% according to them, the cash, bank balance, and little bit of land and housing of low value. So for in India, we have something like 80 million uh, small land holdings out of 105 million land holdings. And they're all, you know, one acre, two acres, three acres, four acres type of people. And that land uh, has some value, but they cannot always sell it. And therefore, it's, it's low value. And they may have a hut or a house of one or two rooms. And so that is the kind of where their wealth is. For the middle class, by popular notion, we consider ourselves middle class, uh, real estate, and perhaps some financial assets. And for the super rich, which is the top 10%, most of the wealth is in actually financial assets. I think this is an important point when we come to the last slide on recommendations uh, of the report. So please uh, flag this. So this is about wealth and income. I just thought since we're talking about India, I will talk about it. So India, China, US, Scandinavia. I just took some outliers there. And US because it's such a important country. So in India, 50% of the income is with the top 10%. Uh, actually, it is 57%. I got that number wrong. I'm sorry. It's about 57% of the income is the top 10%. And the wealth is about 60%. There is inequality. In China, actually, the income inequality is slightly less. So about 40% of the income is with the top 10%. And the wealth percentage is 58%. So I don't know why this is true. But in China, the inequality as of now is slightly less than India. In the US, the income inequality is less than India. Only 42% of the top 10% compared to India's 50%. But the wealth inequality is much higher. 70% of the US wealth is owned by the top 10%. And the US wealth, let us understand, is much, much, much larger than the Indian wealth. And as a more equal society, uh, I could have given all the four countries, but from the report, I just looked at Scandinavia, which all of us know are, you know, Norway and all those countries. The top 10% own only 30% uh, of the have only 30% of the national income. So it is the lowest among the lowest in the world, and the wealth is also much lower. So there are countries which are prosperous where the inequality is also much lower. I think that's the report. So let's please go on. I think this is probably my last slide. So I was not happy with just mentioning the facts, so I went back to the last chapter, which gives some recommendations. Chapter 7. And the report very strongly recommends uh, progressive wealth tax and also progressive income tax. We'll come to the de definitions in the next slide. So in rich countries today, the wealth tax gives only 3.5% of national income. And in poor countries, it's much less. It's 0.5%. And in the US, um, until about 1980, the income tax rates in the highest slide were very high at 80%. So I think the next slide will explain this better. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, you know, this was a bit of a eye-opener for me and some of my friends. We think that the Indian tax rates, for example, are very high. Now, in the US, UK, Germany, or Japan, the top income tax rates reached 80% or more. That means if you're very rich on the top, you know, beyond a million dollars or whatever that number was, you're going to pay 80% tax. Whereas the rates for the poor people at the bottom half, the income tax rates were much lower. And the report also um, kind of emphasizes the point that this was not a one-off thing. 
so between 1936 and 1980 which is a pretty long time you know like three and a half decades or four and a half decades the top income tax rate was consistently more than 70% in india also we had these high income tax rates at one point but there were howls of protest and ideologues and economists and whatever who brought it down but since 1980 which is the uh, era of ronald reagan and what's her name margaret thatcher they reduced the top income tax rates under the ideology that if you reduce the income tax rates the <coughs> revenue collection from tax will actually go up and that you are giving incentive for people to become wealthy and when you tax them very much there nobody has an incentive to be wealthy so all these ideologies and theories were also being floated around which are still very much prevalent today so this is about the progressive income tax so let's go to the next slide which is about wealth and property tax which is different from income tax so wealth tax is very little so for example until 2 3 years ago in india uh, somebody like rakesh junjunwala who is today worth more than 20000 crores largely from buying and selling shares and if you sell shares one year or more after buying them you don't attract capital gains so he he has been paying hardly any income tax or wealth tax because that is considered capital gains now the report says that around the world much of the income and wealth is actually generated from financial assets which are not being taxed and not from income property tax is what we all understand land housing real estate etc etc commercial property that property tax is there but it's not progressive in the sense of income tax that means if you own a property worth 100 crores you will pay the same percentage of tax as if you own a property worth whatever 25 lakhs or 50 lakhs then the report says that the super rich today so they are actually hinting that the world has changed so the super rich in uh, 19th century or 18th century were people with land then after the industrial revolution uh, revolution there were people with large industries people like rockefeller and henry ford and all these guys who were big industrialists and today the wealth is no longer in this the wealth is in financial assets and this is not being taxed so the report argues that these property and wealth taxes should be there and it should be in a progressive way a couple of years ago i don't remember the exact date capital gains tax on share um shares in india uh, came up to a princely sum of 10% and there were howls of protest that means if you buy a share worth 10 rupees and sell it for 100 rupees after 5 years in the good old days you didn't pay any tax on the 90 rupees you earned but today you will have to pay 10% of 90 of 90 rupees very small percent and just for information the capital gains tax in india is much lower than the united states so the report says that this kind of progressive tax on wealth and property can generate substantial revenues for governments to empower billions of people to fight fight climate change create jobs invest in public infrastructure health education so on and so forth i think it's a very well written report because they start off by flagging the issue of wealth which is hardly ever discussed and towards the end when they come to recommendations they say that the large amount of inequality is due to wealth and huge amounts of wealth has been accumulated by 1% or 10% of the people and therefore the governments can actually do many things which they are not able to do so many governments are in deficit indian government is in deficit 36 or nearly 38% of the budget 
of the Indian government is goes into deficit financing, which means payment of interest. So the government has borrowed. And I was shocked to see that between 36 and 40 percent of the budget or the revenues is going towards paying of interest. And that number is increasing. And not only the central government in India, but the state governments are also in deficit. So one of the ways that this report suggests is that by uh, generating revenues through wealth tax, we can bridge this gap. And, you know, India has the lowest percentage of budget going into our national income, going into health and education, which nobody can say is not important. And we can do something about it. That's what the report says. So, and of course, there are questions about whether the government is efficient or inefficient. We have to find ways of making the government accountable and efficient. So let me stop here. I think this is the last slide. I don't, are there any more slides? No, this is the last slide. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the patient hearing. And uh, I've tried to be as faithful as possible to the report. And I'm sure there are some personal opinions which crept in and there are some inaccuracies. But please live with them. And if there are questions and discussions, uh, if possible, I'll try to address them. But I think there are a lot of knowledgeable people here. Some, somebody else can also respond to any of the questions. So let me stop here and thank you, Ram, for uh, yeah. holding this. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Thiruchin, for uh, summarizing this report so well. Uh, I did not introduce you fully. I just thought uh, let you present the report first and then get... I don't need an introduction. This is far no, more no, no. important. <laughs> yeah. but let's get a perspective. I mean, the reason why I'm saying it is because that is a basis for my question to start with. So uh, you work, uh, do a lot of work with uh, farmers uh, through CCD, a uh, lot of grassroots uh, level work. So do you see inequality uh, out there in the field when you're working? Do you see that manifesting itself? And is there, uh, have you chosen the cooperative form because it is a little more egalitarian, equitable, this thing? Uh, for the work that you're doing, you could have even... Um, set up a company uh, and, uh, you know, still benefited the farmers. So that's that's one question that I have. Do you want me to respond to that? Yes, yes, yes. So Sriram, you know, in a global report like this, one hesitates to respond about personal initiatives because personal initiatives are not important. But at a conceptual level, I will respond because it's an important question. I actually feel in a very simple way that the problem with socialism and communism is they don't know how to generate prosperity and wealth. They know, know about redistributive justice. The problem with capitalism is they know how to generate wealth, but it leads to these extreme inequalities and the bottom half continue to remain there. So I personally, I mean, I'm not a very deep thinker, although I do think it's not that I don't think. I feel the cooperative model is a fantastic model. It not only generates wealth, like Amul does, it also spreads it around. So Amul is 50,000 crores plus, and 3.6 million people in Amul alone have benefited from it. And of course, around the country, we have Nandini Diary, etc. So I am a strong believer in cooperative because it both generates wealth and income and prosperity and gives it into the hands of a large number of people. So that's the reason why one works in uh, cooperatives. Your second or the first question was whether you have seen an increase in uh, inequality at the grassroots level. It's a very complicated question because at one level, yes, at one level, no. So our president of the Federation in Anantapur, Mr. Ramna Reddy, I will say Ramna Reddy, why should I call him Mr. He's a farmer. Now, his elder son went to some MBA college and he works for CGI, which I'm told is a very reputed company in Bangalore. And he is doing well. And his daughter-in-law works for Infosys. His second son, who did not go to college for whatever reason, is a driver. So since Ramanati got some money from here and there, probably from his elder son, he bought him a 
what do you call it a proclaimer or a jcb uh, which is a heavy duty earth excavating machine and he manages that in fact we are hiring him for some work we are doing in the cooperative so between two brothers there is a huge inequality now people who are having land on the highway they have sold their land at 10 lakhs and now that land value has gone to 2 crores kia motors anybody is welcome to come and see people who are in the interior very far away from that the land is still worth 1 to 5 lakhs so has inequality in wealth increased of course it has increased dramatically has inequality increased within families of course it has increased dramatically is it good or bad i don't know so let me stop here sri ram so this is my kind of nuanced response to your very important question so uh, hari natarajan has put a few questions in the chat but i'll ask him to ask the questions himself instead of no yeah 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 and if i don't know the answer then i will invite somebody else to answer hari you can come in please hari Uh, hello. Yeah, please come. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I think my first question was really around this whole uh, uh, analysis between public debt, uh, uh, sorry, public wealth and private wealth. And I was wondering whether it needs to be looked one more layer because public wealth is essentially the infrastructure. Hari, we are losing you. I think you have got a loose connection. we are not able to hear you sri ram can you hear him no 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 uh, so let let me sort of uh, ask uh, yes, read out his question yeah yeah let me let me try and do that maybe i can also pull it out yeah, yeah it's okay so i'll read it out for you uh uh or 25 30 year period would public uh, wealth actually show only incremental increases towards upkeep of infrastructure invested at the start of that period do we need higher longer term frames uh, uh, i mean longer term frames to say that private wealth is going going faster than public wealth so horizons is what he is talking about actually the short answer is i don't know uh, why the public wealth is not increasing that fast uh, i really don't know uh, uh, but let me uh, let me uh, you know jerry rao uh, recently wrote a piece in the print i was afraid that he would be on this because he totally ideologically opposed to correct so speaking. what what do you, i mean he says that uh, high taxation uh, is disincentivizes wealth creation and that's not the way uh, there is this argument that you should increase the pie and not worry about the share in the pie why can't we do both why can't we increase the pie and also increase the tax rates and you know a lot of uh, misinformation is there in europe scandinavia and in the united states which is the bastion of free market capitalism the tax rates are progressive and much higher than in india so he should go and ask the us government uh, why they are having such tax rates and why he doesn't want it in india the amazing thing i find is that economics being a pretty complex subject which i frankly i mean i am saying it honestly i don't fully understand or don't understand much at all you find one thing where is very clear that those who benefit from the current system argue in favor of it and those who do not benefit from it they argue against it and there are enough arguments and facts you can pull out like jerry rao has done to push one point of view you can give 10 other facts to show that this is not true so i don't know the answer to that but at a personal level and i am speaking ideologically i don't agree with it i don't think that this is really true Trilochan, there's one more. You know, one way to reduce inequality, obviously, the uh, path pathways given in the report is to have a graded and progressive taxation of both income as well as wealth. Correct. That is what I could understand. Yeah, which is fine. Uh, is there uh, any way that we can look at uh, inequality across countries, <clears throat> and is there a way in which we can deal with that? You know. <clears throat> yeah so the report does talk about it and one has to go through the report uh, whatever i could understand there is inequality across countries and they say that with the growth of the emerging economies 
the inequality across countries is actually coming down i mean you can see that india and china are much more prosperous than they were so the inequality between these two countries and the traditional west which is europe and america has come down but what the report shows is that the inequality within countries whether it is europe or america or india or china the inequality within countries has grown up has gone up tremendously and you know i would not i mean i would worry about national uh, this thing and all that but globally the inequality has definitely gone up and it has gone up to alarming levels according to so let let me sort of take you back to your field once again i mean the reason why i'm harping on it is just to understand you know one of the things that is always argued is higher level of inequality leads to social disturbance because of aspirational stuff and so on do you see any of those things you know since you're so closely associated with the field Uh, do you see at least signs of those things that there is a social unrest or there is uh, some pent up anger um, because of inequality yes i do see that now whether it is logical or not i cannot uh, answer so i ask our farmers so you know we are in the middle of inequality because our farmers federation is right opposite kia motors so kia motors in a place like anantapur has invested more than 2 billion dollars and their cars are selling right here bangalore and they are also going to introduce ev or uh, electric vehicles and so on and they are doing well and they have created jobs so if you ask the farmers there because we work with the farmers and they are all living in that vicinity that what do you think of kia motors one thing they say is idi mamalli munchutundi in telugu it says he amko duboyega this will drown us so i said why he says we don't get anything out of this land prices have gone up wage rates have gone up tremendously so kia motors following the corporate norms will pay everybody minimum wage and give them social security not social security but whatever pf and uh, medical and this and that and the wage rates uh, have gone up and they say that uh, now we as farmers cannot afford to pay that so we are all going to suffer because of that so there is a resentment it could be partly emotional and psychological and partly factual so uh, this is a fact that when modern development enters the interior areas there are winners and losers uh, the governments and the corporates highlight the winners which is fine i mean there are winners i'm not saying there are no winners and in the long run 20 40 years everybody does benefit but 40 years is a lifetime for many people you know if you are already 40 50 years old or even 35 years old 40 years is your life and the remaining part of your life is in a miserable situation so there is a resentment uh, among one section of the people some of the younger people like ramna reddy's son who uh, has become a driver in kia motors he is got a vehicle and he gets 30 40 thousand bucks and he is happy but majority of the people don't get such jobs so they are very unhappy so it's a kind of complicated it's like a, a elephant entering a pond where there's a lot of disturbance and maybe some good happens the elephant definitely gets clean but what happens to uh, the other people in the pond and how that we don't know what is going on we don't re- uh, record all so um since there are no other questions i'll ask one more yes yeah. Relating to your work uh, with India, you know the type of people who are entering the you know parliament and entering the electoral fray. You India has been constantly documenting their wealth, uh, and you are saying more and more wealthy people are coming. Uh, is that you know now you are saying poorer governments, but possibly richer representatives who are running? No question. Right. Uh, so. Uh, so even democracy doesn't seem to be a solution to this is it uh, or the way we have structured a democracy doesn't seem to be a solution yeah i think your second statement is right i mean democracy in its purest form everybody will support including me and you but the way it's implemented so we just uh, have completed a whole lot of election watches in uttar pradesh uttarakhand goa and punjab where the elections are coming up and we have released all those reports 
so the average wealth of mlas from in the last 5 years has gone up by leaps and bounds in fact i don't know why people come to iim and do an mba they should join politics because the growth in wealth will be much uh, higher now i'll give you a classic example of this uh, it, it is actually i will call it uh, uh, illegal rowdy wealth extraction so we are just almost completed a purchase of land of about 86 acres through some donor because we want to showcase how to do better agriculture and help the farmers etc now the land registration now this is the third land deal in every registration the local elected representative mostly the mlas they ask for a huge bribe so which means they want some 10 or 20000 they were able to come down to 10000 so if you want 86 acres at 20000 it you can do the number some whatever uh, 1.6 crores or 1.7 crores you have to give them as a bribe then they negotiate down to 80 lakhs of course we did not pay that bribe but we negotiated with the principal secretary chief say we have various connections so we were able to sort it out but for the ordinary person ordinary small businessman or farmer who is doing into all this they have to pay a cut to these uh, elected representatives and they have beaten up uh, sub registrars uh, in two places and the sub registrar was very scared of us because he knows that we are legally right but that guy is threatening them anyway we have a way of sorting it out we have sorted it out so this extortion and rent extraction from various transactions is one source of wealth now this guy he has taken a loan from a rich industrialist in that area uh, who has set up a 100 acre acz plant uh, for making uh, active pharma ingredients etc good businessman and very ethical also but he has advanced a huge loan to this uh, mla now whether the mla will repay it or not we don't know but probably had no choice but to finance his election now after taking that money he is extracting more money and then down the line what happens is if you are uh, even a small guy who opening a motor repair shop for uh, on the highway or a dhaba or a small restaurant or some kirana store etc all of them have to pay some something or the other because there is an army of inspectors and fssai uh, in, in income tax uh, vat gst pollution control weights and measures so many things are there and all of them you have, you have to pay off somebody or the other so the cost of doing business in these kind of uh, violent situations not violent i will call it elephant entering a pond kind of situation which is a new model of development is actually extracting rents and making uh, business less efficient and more corrupt and a fair share of that wealth uh, this extraction goes to the elected representatives so this is happening definitely it's happening so sunil vinayak has a question i'll just uh, briefly put it he, he his question is is amul an exception do cooperatives uh, across the world uh, do they perform the same sort of intervention like amul does or amul is just an ex- exception as a cooperative brilliant question i would like to thank the speaker for this in india we treat amul as an exception but if you look at the situation worldwide and i have done a lot of study because this is a fascinating subject for me the world's largest and most successful and most profitable cooperatives are actually in the capitalist free market economies the world's largest cooperative is chs chs you can google it it's an agricultural cooperative in the united states it's well in excess of 40 billion dollars i don't know what the exact number is and many of these cooperatives are actually genuine cooperative owned by farmers managed by farm of the farmer by the farmer for the farmer etc no government interference no political interference is just run like a business owned by large number of farmers the reason these are able to succeed in countries like the us and europe europe also has many very fantastic cooperatives many of them are in the fortune one of them is in the fortune 100 and quite a few of them are in the fortune 500 so they are not chota mota cute things Uh, as an experiment which we should wonder whether it will ever work it is working at a massive scale 
I mean, that's the point I want to make. Why doesn't it work in India? It's a long discussion, but why doesn't it work in India is because we don't allow it to function. The government, the bureaucracies, all the intellectuals sitting here, the policy makers, they will not allow it to function. They have no clue what a cooperative is. They have no clue how to run a business. They will make all kinds of policies. Now they have launched a 10,000 FPO program. The chairman of NABAD, I was on the board of NABAD, he privately asked me, what do you think of these FPO? And NABAD has got the mandate to promote these FPO. FPOs are basically cooperatives. So he said, do you think they'll succeed? I said, what do you think? I'm just quoting what the chairman of NABAD, then chairman of NABAD, the friend of mine said, he said, they will all fail. I said, I agree with you because the schemes are all cock and bull schemes. See, everybody is allowed to design what an FPO is, including guys who have given up their lifetime earnings in Goldman Sachs, come back to Bangalore, who are dying to give back to society. He doesn't know whether the groundnet grows below the ground or above the ground. These fellows are making policies based on what model they have thought in the US. I know I'm getting a little sarcastic and angry. Everybody is allowed to think about it except two groups. The most important group being the farmers. They are not consulted. They are all stupid people. They don't know anything. We will tell them what to do. And people who have been doing grassroots work for 20, 30 years. You put these two people together, cooperatives will succeed in India because it's a no brainer. Who are the people who want to be prosperous? Most, not intellectuals like you and me. The people who want to become prosperous are the poor. And in our case, the farmers, the farmers are dying to become prosperous and they're not that stupid as we think. They may not know some English, but Ramana Reddy's son, he's a, he speaks Telugu. He doesn't speak English and his son is working for CGI. Where did that son get his IQ from? From heaven, is it? He got a good, so Ramana Reddy is intelligent. 1% to 5% of rural India, whether it is in Jhumri Talaya, UP, West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, wherever you go, they are intelligent and smart. They can manage it. And Gujarat is an example. We just don't allow this to happen. We have so many policies and conditions and this and that. I'm sorry I got a little emotional, but that's no, not right. a problem at all. Uh, one last question, Trirochan. Hari also has a question, uh, which is a little... Uh, Hari, would you like to ask that question? Uh, because you sort of missed uh, last time. Uh, I just uh, yeah, his voice was cut off. Yeah, I I just uh, one minute, I unmute you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Shira. Uh, sorry, I had Wi-Fi issues. That's why I dropped off earlier. I had a number of questions, but I leave that aside. I kind of uh, relate to what you were saying right now. Is policies are being made without actually that end user being uh, uh, factored in. I'm just curious, uh, you know, they're the larger majority, they're 65, 70% of the people. Why isn't there, why aren't they making greater noise? Or are we beginning to see the, uh, you know, the start of such things with the farmer revolt that we had against the farm laws and so on? I'm just curious because you're working on this a lot more. I'm constantly surprised at how little reaction or, uh, you know, reward there is from the people that we always claim to be helping but never doing it for the last 70 plus years. Ari, excellent question. This is an age-old question. Why doesn't the revolution happen? I'm not talking about a communist revolution. Of course, one has thought about it. Actually, getting collective action with a focus is one of the most difficult things. It's not easy to do. And uh, the people feel disempowered for various reasons. The guy is poor. He doesn't have time and energy to go into all these revolutions or whatever we may call it. When he goes to any government office, he has to pay a bribe or he has to do salam to this fellow, that fellow. Whatever his interaction is with the formal world makes him feel disempowered. Now for thousands of people to come together and make this happen is difficult. But it has happened. The great Dr. Korean used to hold rallies, rallies or whatever, farmer meetings with 1 lakh, 2 lakh people. He personally told me, and of course, Sriram knows Dr. Korean a little bit more than me. He told me that he 
held a big meeting and he got to and he got the deputy prime minister and cabinet ministers when they saw the crowd they just kept quiet because they understand numbers because they don't want to go against his vote bank in our own small case we are working in anandpur with some 25000 for 23000 to 25000 farmers the mlas and the district administration does not wag its tail i mean we have to assert our collective power but it took us 10 15 years to organize them it doesn't happen like that so that is the that is how the revolutions happen i mean we are not talking about a communist revolution we just talking about a simple revolution so hari the short answer is i don't know the longer answer is what i gave you and it is very difficult for people to come together uh, to make all this happen come with me to the field and uh, we'll discuss it in greater length thanks a lot triluchin there's no outside questions i have a few questions but i'll discuss with uh, you over a cup of tea sometime later uh thank you very much for sparing time and reading the report so carefully and summarizing it uh, there has been a lot of comments which said that this was a wonderful summary uh thanks for joining us and thanks everybody else for uh, joining this uh, inequality conversation series we will continue with this series the next talk will be after a small gap we'll have it on 2nd of march where professor deepak malgan will talk about uh, the historical uh, aspects of inequality and he'll his he told me that 2nd of march is a special day uh, where there is a gandhi versus irwin sort of a exchange going on so we look forward to that and we will continue this series uh, in all earnest uh, thank you very much for joining thank you thank you thank you